Hello there everybody, this is Reggie Time with Russ again and we're back with Russ just doing a live sweat. Russ has taken some notes on the thoughts, feelings, emotions, call them what you, whatever you want to call them, that he's gone through during the week. Um, and we're going to continue with the with the mental game, motivation, that kind of thing theme. It's not really a technical series, it's more Russ being good enough to be really open with us about his what he goes through on his weekly grind and hopefully that... Uh, ringing a bell with some of you guys and hopefully between us Russ and I can bottom most of them and it'll help you bottom and get through some of like, process some of your thoughts too so before we start Russ how has your week gone in terms of rebuilding your bankroll I think it's gone pretty well I've decided I've tried to be really vigilant and not keep checking the uh, <laughs> sorry buddy I didn't, really, I didn't want to bring it up uh, please, please Russ and I don't do that much work before we start because I hadn't even asked him that um, I, don't, I wasn't aware that you weren't checking your balance sorry chief do you think no, it's no, gone it's, well though I think it should be up because we hit a, I think we started at 175 we hit a low of about 160 at one point and I'm pretty sure I should be hopefully over the 185 190 mark i would say so it's been good and which is really odd considering it's probably been the lowest amount of volume i've played in a while as well because there was a couple of days this week i just didn't feel it and um before i'd still sit down and probably grind out about you know three tables and do a couple of thousand hands and then wonder why i wasn't winning um so and obviously my the pace of my game has changed as well because last week he gave me the goal of taking a lot more notes and so i'm not the because i play my setup isn't sitting at a desk at a computer i sit at my tv on my sofa with a wireless keyboard so um it's a bit harder for me to sit here and type so i have to sit out quite a bit which is really nice because it's kind of broken up the pace of the game so i'm not I, th I think sometimes I get kind of hypnotized by it. I kind of lose my surroundings and if things are going wrong that's when things can really melt down whereas if I'm looking to take notes mark players it takes me out of that for a little while I have yeah, to sit you, out you take can the get like a trance like state I think when you're playing speed park you can just get like some rhythmic clicking can't you and I certainly it's a bit like when you're um when you're driving down a road and then you get four miles down it and you think what the fuck have we been you know i don't remember any of that the last four part the last few minutes of this journey it's can be like that a bit with but it can be for me anyway with um with speed poker i can definitely just tune out sometimes mm -hmm. so yeah you're right anything that can help punctuate that and break that up if that's something that you suffer with oh. is certainly a good thing but we don't want to be losing too much volume of course no no I, when i say it's just it's just a bit further down than what it was on previous weeks and that's basically because there are a couple of days where i didn't feel it so i thought well i'm not going to play there are a couple of days where i thought well this i kind of want to have a go got about 20 minutes in and just thought this isn't go this just isn't working so i thought rather than just keep plugging away i'll step away and then i think yesterday and today i've kind of had the bug again so i've put in the put in some work today it's gone quite well i think <laughs> you know so the I mean? days I'm that you weren't feeling it what do you mean by you weren't <sighs> feeling it I think it's more, uh, I don't know, there's just this, I'm not sure what triggers it, but there's a just a general kind of, it's it's more of a feeling I should be playing rather than I want to be playing. And that's just it, We're, as recreational players, we should never have a feeling of we should be playing. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the beauty of being a recreational player, you know, if we don't want to play, just don't play, you know, it's, it's absurd that we should we like almost turn poker into like a, a job you know or oh, better go and punch in and do a few hours that's you know? it yeah and then, definitely um, no you just do it when you're feeling it i mean i've found when i'm off work like I, I was off work all of august i lost a lot of my not didn't lose my hunger to play but because i could play whenever i wanted it quite often i didn't want to play and since i've gone back to work on on thursday i've done a couple of shifts now i'm almost gagging to play when i get home and that's um that's um it's a strange thing it's uh, it's almost like you, when i was like working in a shit job that i didn't like um my d dream if you will <clears throat> was to just be playing poker all the time for my um for my living and i've had the chance to do that on two or three occasions since i got made redundant four years ago and every time that i've just done like poker pretty much is the only thing i'm doing for a few weeks i don't it's nowhere near as much as good as, a, as i thought it would be you know the, the the dream of wanting it and then the reality of having it are two very very different things in that's really inter yeah it's really interesting you brought it up because um i was actually thinking um 
part of it is is like i don't actually know what i want from it and i'm not even sure if i need to know does that make sense it's i'm not sure where it's come from where i'm kind of thinking where do i want this to to go and um that's not very good we'll see that go um and i think that's part of the problem is that you know there are some people out there that have got dreams of being top level crushers and all this kind of stuff and for me, I think doing this as a job, like full time, that would drive me absolutely nuts. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I'm not sure if it's something I'd want to do for eight to ten hours every day. And once I realise that I don't actually have to worry about where it's going, I can just sit down and play. It kind of relieved a bit of the pressure. You know, it's it's just strange thoughts that come up when you when you decide you want to take something a bit more seriously. My mind tends to go from extremes. It doesn't just say, well, let's see where it goes and enjoy a bit of study. It's kind of like, well, if you're going to study it, you've got to aim for the top and i was just like well i don't even know if i want to get there do you know what i mean i completely know what you mean i'm i one of the biggest criticisms people have of me is that why are you still playing like the micro stakes when you know i've, I've made a lot of money a lifetime i've made over six figures lifetime from poker um mm -hmm. and i've spent most of it to be honest with you. <laughs> saved and spent it and just like cost of living and what have you and um it's i don't want to either i mean i'd, I'd be happy yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy just playing for for penny stakes that that I'm completely comfortable with them. Um, I don't want the stress. Whenever I played higher, and I did play higher for, a, I think it was when would it been a 2013. I started off 2013 on a super heater. I was playing 100 nil on triple eight, and I had a monster heater and about nine k in the client, which is the most I've ever had in a poker client. And then um, I started playing some 200 nil. And and I, I got it up to whatever it was, twelve k something like that. And I played some four hundred nil, and I won my biggest ever pot. And my ass was falling out. I was absolutely, you know, I've never been this scared in my life. Um, I got it in with like bottom set versus top two, and it was like a ended up being like a sixteen hundred dollar pot or something like that. And I was just like, I don't want that hassle ever again. Those turn the rivers coming down were like the longest can one and a half seconds of my life and it was after i just had to sit out straight i apologized to the guy who, who was who took the money from because he was playing three-handed because i knew i was going to hit and run him not because i wanted to hit and run him just because mm -hmm. it was just too much for me and um then we had to i had to withdraw quite a lot of my bankroll because i needed to buy a new car and we needed to get a new boiler at home before you know it me my 12k bankroll was back down to about 3k again because we just spent it on on things that we needed like cars and boilers i mean you need transport and warmth in life don't you you need that more than you need money in a poker client i guess so it was, it was lucky that i'd had that huge heater that allowed me to just pay for things that most people have to get bank loans for so i was pleased about that and then i lost motivation for a while because when you've been playing those stakes, dropping back down to 15L almost literally the very next day, it was a big shock, but I've never ever wanted to get back there again. I'm just happy now, you know, I mean, I've got my life set up where I do this, obviously, I mean, grinder school pays me not a huge amount of money, but, you know, it's it's it's, it's one, like, maybe one-fifth, maybe one, one-sixth of my of my income, then I've got the poker playing, I've got the poker coaching, then I've got two different day jobs too, and all of those things coming together to have like lots of different small income streams just helps me massively emotionally. I um, When I got made redundant of my job back in 2011, all my eggs were in one basket and I was thinking, shit, what on earth am I going to do now, you know, because I was, I was in a good job, I worked in a, lab, in a lab, I was getting paid way above the average wage for where I live, and but because I've got no um no qualifications, which I'm a very, very, <laughs> that is unlucky for him. I'm not very well qualified at all. I haven't got anything better than like a, a, a secondary school education and not a very good one at that. Um, I don't have that. Basically, all jobs I have to do now are pretty much close to minimum wage work. So I just thought I don't ever want all my eggs in one basket again. And I feel if I ended up playing much higher stakes poker, um, I, I would feel then I'd like a lot of eggs in one basket again. I'm happy with poker playing being maybe 40 percent of my income i wouldn't want it to be a significant part of my income because it would take away a lot of what i get from poker which is just the thrill of the gamble the enjoyment of playing and the, the confidence of knowing that i only play games that i, that I can beat you know i don't mm -hmm. want to be playing games and and then having the stress of do i beat this game or don't i beat this game you know, I, I know I beat 30 and L, I know I beat 50 and L on Sky, I know I, all the games I play, I know that I win. I win in long term. So I never really pressure, even when I'm on a downswing, I don't have the, am I in the right game for me pressure. I don't have a lot of the pent up anxiety, frustration, all those things that, that lots of the other regulars have that makes like 
a lot of poker discussion there is so toxic i don't have any of that and so i totally get where you're coming from you know just because you lack ambition to become like a, a higher stakes player you can be it doesn't it doesn't detract from you as like being taken as a credible poker player it shouldn't make you feel bad about yourself because it's just you being very self-aware of what you want poker to be for you and your awareness that means i don't know what i want it to be but i know what i don't want it to be and that's fine it's absolutely fine there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever and anyone that tells you otherwise is you know they're just talking nonsense they're just basically pushing their ambitions and their viewpoint onto you and then um, that's kind of why I, I try to avoid poker as, as much as i can these days because you there's like a lot of like there's a small minority of how can we put it malcontented grinders that just hawk the same message around over and over again and it's like it it feels like that's the only way to do things but i've spoke to so many people in the last two years and there is that there's tons of people like you and me out there there's been we know that with like the facebook group we've got with the skype group we've got there's loads of guys just like us that then even post on forums and things because they're worried about you know being belittled and being mocked so don't worry that you like, don't think that you're in a minority because I, I can promise you you're absolutely not do you have like a hard to call full-time grinders mentality no you don't is that going to prevent you from being a winning player that, why would it there's no reason why it should so yeah well, i wouldn't worry about not knowing what you want it to be as long as you know what you don't want it to be you can at least have some sense of direction in my opinion you don't okay. need you just don't need to be you know aiming to be the next nananoko or the next doug polk or the next looking leather ass or all these things you don't need to be any of those guys you just can just be the next russ you know you can just be the best russ you can be and that's it <laughs> so all you need yeah. to do just and tried that one third bet here and that didn't quite work no, out it didn't but... quite work out this time but never mind no nah, that's cool now it's i'm not saying that i won't get there and maybe that will change as it develops but i think at this point trying to have that aim just uh, makes more trouble because you know it, it, it applies more pressure in situations where i think well, i need to i don't know enough so the more you try new things then the worse your game becomes um, these games are well aggro tonight aren't they they are a bit should have probably there actually but yeah and i think it's just it's just taking it at a reasonable pace do you know and because uh, as we discussed in group yesterday as well it's just the amount of times that people have so many concepts and i'm guilty of it as well so so many concepts running around in their mind that they hit the tables and then your mind just goes blank you're like well am i meant to see bet here what am i meant to you know one person says see bet this amount one person says see bet this amount, and you just completely lose anything and before you know it you've just done a few oh that's nice done a few buy-ins and that's what demotivates me a lot is starting to is um kind of like the trickle down thing it's it's like it seems like a very fine line if i can keep myself level and just play sort of how i'm comfortable playing when i start putting in all the other factors of how i think i should be playing and it doesn't work out then all hell breaks loose yeah i mean that's what we've talked about a lot in the group in our group sessions not sure if you and i've talked about it individually but um my way of like trying to help players isn't to mold them as that like, in my image if you will and i think trying to model your game on somebody else to try and copy other people's games i don't think that's helpful for lots of players because we're all different that those players have those have developed those games because that's what suits their personality so it suits their character it's what suits their like, behavioral tendencies and they've kind of molded a game for that that suits them and if you try and be someone that you're not you know you're going to give yourself a lot of problems my idea of poker is have some like loose boundaries of what's acceptable is i mean obviously like jamming all in be seven two off is tenable <laughs> you know and stuff like that so try and like loosely have like just have a solid fundamentals in the game and then deviate from it in ways that like suit you would you, suit you personally and if something's not working and then um, you know you're doing something that ends up being a leak but we can look into that and we can say well Russ, you know you might like doing this but this actually doesn't work so how can we you know substitute this because what happens a lot of the time is you'll end up in situations that you're not comfortable with or you'll end up like creating situations from one leak you've got that will create leaks elsewhere and things so you can't just do whatever the hell you want but you don't have to like copy i mean this is why i don't like things like that best poker coaching who just like give you a crib sheet of exactly how to play every situation mm -hmm. because um there's just no allowance there for 
for your fears, for your insecurities, for your like creative flair. There's nothing there. It's just when you have this hand in this situation, do this thing. I mean, if that's what you want poker to be, and you know that for some people that might be exactly what they need poker to be. But um, it's it's not for me. It's my things. I let's have a really good grounding in like the poker fundamentals, and then build our own style on it. And that's that's what I try and encourage people to do. Um, yeah, sometimes things don't work out. Sometimes things work out great. Sometimes you have mixed results. Well, what does it matter? If you're being true to yourself, you're going to enjoy it a lot more. And as long as you're being true to yourself, it doesn't make you like some massive losing plate and fish. Then you're going to enjoy it more. You're going to have more motivation to play. You're going to put the volume in. You're going to put the work in. And you will just naturally improve if you have a mindset that I want to improve. Then wanting to improve doesn't necessarily mean copying someone else's style. It just means improving your own game within within like the, the parameters of what what's a, like permissible for a better word and being a winning player still you know, there's lots of different ways of doing things there really is yeah definitely i'm just wondering what do you do you use any have you or did you use any techniques when you were first starting out to try and stay level-headed while you're playing because um one thing i've noticed i'm trying to monitor it it's kind of hard to sometimes monitor it when you're getting stuck into it but I notice there's like a sort of a physiological change actually happens like a when I get uh, like earlier on just before we took this session actually I had a pair of queens and I bet the the flop and the turn for value the river came the over card so I checked it back and sure enough he had had the top or he had had top pair on the flop and I had an over pair the river gave him two pair and almost instantly before I could even just say well carry on with the next hand I was call this once oh nice before we could carry on with the next hand. I'd already called a three bet out of position, which all day today, I'm going to bet small and, and um, yeah, and already my discipline had gone out the window straight away, you know, and I'd but already was been... Was that a lack of discipline or was that just a little bit of just not, not thinking? Which which was it? You know, did you, it was, did you choose to call the three bet or had you kind of called it just without thinking? No, no, I chose to. I was like, I got ace, queen out of position and I've been folding that quite happily most of the day in situations just carrying on playing and doing quite well and as soon as I had the the sort of the suck out we should say you know where he'd called down with his under pair and then hit the two pair on the river instantly I was just like oh fuck it and, and call and I don't know I just I, I I just wonder if there's anything that you'd suggest to actually stop doing that. Do you know what I mean? Where you can just... Because I know I watched one of your YouTube videos and there was a hand in there where you flop the nuts and then the guy hit his gut shot on the river and then he just... And it just sort of was like water off a duck's back and you're straight into the next hand and it didn't matter. Whereas for me, that's like fuel to the fire and then especially if, at the, if in the same session I folded to three bets at a position a few times with reasonable hands and then that happens that's when I start feeling, you know, all of a sudden there'll be some loose calls coming in. And I'm just wondering if there's anything you do to check yourself or is it just experience over time or what? I was an absolutely fucking massive tilt monkey. And I mean massive. Um, you name it, I had every fucking shape, form of tilt going. I've, to my shame, um, if, we're, if we're sharing like our innermost like, feelings and, and memories and things mm -hmm. i've damaged equipment i've damaged my physically damaged my hands you know by fucking lashing out and just punching my desk punching a wall you know that one side just hit my laptop screen with just like flicked it with my fingers and the fucking whole thing just went horribly wrong and um that cost me like 90 pounds to fix it and uh, yeah um, there was no one moment that's got me through that it's just learning that it's fucking stupid to punch walls because <laughs> your knuckle hurts it's learning that it's stupid to flick your hand at a fucking and I still do it now I mean that wasn't only a couple of years ago I banged my table and my drink splashed all over my keyboard and fucking ruined a laptop you know um, so yeah I mean I just do it less and less these days that's all it is and um, I think it's because I'm more happy in my life situation now than I was when I was super tilting. Because I was in a job, I was, it was at the time I was like, got, I had my worst tilt issues. Because after I got made redundant, I went and took a job as a benefits assessor in an office, and it was like the worst job I've ever had in my life. It was it was boring. It was a horrible, horrible atmosphere. Um, I just wasn't very happy in life. So I re when I when I played poker and things went bad for me, I responded really badly to it. So. Um, 
I think the first thing is what we talked about already. Don't start sessions if you're not in a good place. Mm -hmm. That will help the shooter. And if sessions start going sour, for me, if, if someone starts going sour for me, I can usually start feeling my guts. I start getting like a, like a bit of anxiety in my guts. That's it's it, almost yeah. like I know that, right, I'm going to screw up in a minute. I'm just going to fucking screw up. I've had enough now, I'm going to screw up. And now when that happens, I'm, I'm usually quite good at just checking myself and saying, you know, just like mentally saying to myself, right, you need to focus here because you know, you, you are approaching the point where you're going to lose control. You know, I'm on my way up, and then once you pass that threshold, that's when you lose control. You know, it's like, I, I put to on YouTube not so long ago about that, the, I did it at work, about that, the emotional arousal cycle, where you when you're on the way up, you can sort of control it, but once you reach, like, crisis point, you lose all control. And it's like when the red mist comes down, and that's when, to you, like steal from Jared Tendler, that's when you find out what you've learned to a level of subconscious competence because that's when all your poker sense goes out all the stuff that you're in the process of learning and don't have 100 percent control over that's when all these mistakes starts coming in so if you're like when you're tilting you're making calls out of position with stuff that that you wouldn't normally call with that tells you that you need to that's something you need to write focus even more on until it becomes you know as natural as folding seven two if you're saying that I'm, I'm working very hard on on my not calling three bets out of position you need to keep working on that and if that shows and it, when you think you've got it nailed if it shows up when you're tilting it means you haven't got it nailed still so uh, i think it's for me it's i very rarely get to crisis point these days very rarely because mm. usually i just stop the session beforehand i just like snap close the client but um, i think it only comes with experience and you just gotta like you gotta know yourself you gotta know your own body and for me i definitely get it's like, it'll be like fucking hell not again I'll start having those thoughts and that'll be the first trigger to me to say right if you're going to be like this do something else but usually I'll try and stick at it you know I'll be like no well come on we can get through this and then if, if, if a few couple of good things happen I'm over it but if then during that period things go wrong again I know I'll three bet a couple of times and miss or I'll three bet queens and jacks and the ace or the king will always pop and though if things bad keep, if bad things keep happening then my stomach starts churning that's when i now know right we need to just stop this session i'll usually stop playing for the for the day at that point unless it's in the morning or something and i'll try and play later on but if i start getting that feeling at nine or ten o'clock i'm done for the day because even if i like start again at midnight or one o'clock it's not out of my system long enough you know these sort of things can take quite a while to clear from your system it's like um to use like the analogy that will continue with that for people with learning disabilities or people they're the people i work with quite often even if they've like come out of crisis stage while they're coming down while the adrenaline is still coursing through their body they're very prone to going straight back into crisis and that could take you know a couple of hours for that to to leave the body and it's, it's the same for us as poker players or it is for me anyway um i don't just go off till if i can't just stop playing for 10 minutes and go back again quite often it, it takes me a good few hours or even asleep to process that tilt properly so um it's just learning your own tilt cycle really and knowing how long it takes you to get over it how long it um can you actually manage it in the in the like the in the stage from baseline to crisis when you're going up can you manage it in that situation can you get it under control or once you start going up for now is that not your trigger to just say well i'm going up now and usually i can't control it so i'm just, while, while i'm still in control i'm going to stop my session and mm -hmm. these are all things for you to figure out for yourself because absolutely everybody's different i mean some guys just never seemed to tilt phil galform was like legendary for just not tilting he'd just go he grind he grind again grind he grind he grind until he broke and then whatever um it'd be lovely to to be able to get like that but no it's i don't have those skills so rather than try and like work towards being tilted as much as i do try and work towards it i'm still aware that yeah i'm laid back than most i'm more laid back than most players i have a higher tilt threshold than lots of players these days but i know i still am prone to destructive tilt if i don't manage it in the in the early stages so i guess the what i'm trying to say is try and spot the early symptoms then learn or try and learn to manage them and then um, until you learn to manage them just quit early that, that would be my advice you know as, as basic as that sounds mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely true i've definitely noticed that um poker especially late it never really started that way but the more i've tried to take it a bit more seriously and learn it and obviously that 
itself breeds a little more frustration because when you first start you don't know what the mistakes are you don't know what a suck out is or you'll you know have an idea of your percentage to win but now i've definitely find that it provides a pretty good ground that if you're having a bit of a shit day in real life say things aren't going your work things aren't really working out how you expect or you know it provides a really good place to take out those frustrations it does um and it's very strange it's like and it's not really my personality it's not really how i go about things but sometimes i don't know it's just lately it's uh i think it's more because i've there's there's obviously i've got some issue which i can't quite figure out yet about playing for bigger money um, I'm not sure because there's obviously a reason why I've hit like 10 and L twice and it sounds so stupid because it's like 10 and L is not even big money but um, as the sums get bigger then my I don't know it's almost like a self-sabotage thing does that make sense it's it, kind of or if I have a goal one, it, it makes total sense and that's something that I went through in 2008 2009 I couldn't for the life of me crack 50 and L for all and Betfair fifty now back then was it was ridiculously soft, <clears throat> and um, <coughs> excuse me, and I could crush. I was crushing twenty and L for there was no thirty and L, and it went twenty to fifty on Betfair. Thirty and L didn't exist, uh, so it was quite a big jump. It was like one hundred and fifty percent up in like from from twenty to fifty, and then I was crushing twenty and L for whatever fourteen blinds a hundred over a decent sample size because it was that fucking soft. But every time I got to fifty and L, it's it came down I, I think i finally diagnosed it as like almost like a fear of success because that's like being able to beat 50 and l for like a decent win rate and decent money that represented the opportunity for me to perhaps change my life if you will mm-hmm. not in like a huge way but it went from being like playing 20 and l for a hobby playing maybe forty thousand hands a month making maybe 50 buy-ins that's it which is nice you know it's not to be sniffed at it's like a thousand dollars a month but it wasn't like quite enough at the time that was when i was wanting to still be like a professional poker player so I knew it wasn't quite enough but every time i got to 50 and l and then thinking you know maybe i can make 3k a month at 50 and l it was almost like i had a fear of success it's almost like i didn't want to win because i didn't want to be presented with the decision of am i going to quit work to play poker and that's kind of i think it was definitely like a fear of success and looking back i definitely i didn't deliberately self-sabotage but I don't know, half the time, it's just like I couldn't wait to get back to 20 and L again. I just wanted to get back into my comfort zone. Playing 50 and L, it was, I just, I could never get comfortable doing it. And then mm. one time, fortunately, I, I took a move up <clears throat> and um, I ran incredibly well and I made quite a lot of money quite quickly and I was then like overalled for it and then I felt pretty comfortable again. Um, and I don't know, it's like, I don't know what it is to you because uh, we don't know what your ambitions are yet. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure it's not the actual amounts of money that make me scared and self sabotage. I'm sure no, it's not that. It's probably not even poker related. That's the whole point. I'm not, you know, I know we're kind of talking poker game here, but it's obviously something that's a bit deeper. Does that? It's, um, it is. It's like a. It's not a fear of failure, and I think it's more the fact that I'm kind of accepting of failure. It's more the fear of actually doing something well. <laughs> it's kind of weird. It's almost like you're going to be. It's. It's in my mind. I guess it's you're going to be seen as you're meant to know what you're doing. And I kind of pride myself on kind of going through life not really having a clue what I'm doing. Yeah, I think that <laughs> sounds a bit like a self-esteem issue. <clears throat> yeah, you know, like um, little old Russ doesn't deserve to be, or he's not good enough in, he's not, he's not whatever, he's not intelligent enough, he's not good enough, or whatever. Little old Russ isn't good enough to be able to make a thousand dollars a month from poker. So why bother trying? It's that's what it felt like to me because I, I said I came from like a, I've, I've got a poor education. Um, I've always, like, until I worked my way up through the company I was working for, I'd always done, like, quite low-paid jobs. I started at that company as, like, a process worker. Mm-hmm. They worked my way up through process worker, machine operator, team leader into the labs. And I never, I've always, it's only, like, since of maybe the last two or three years where I've, I've stopped giving even the slightest shit what anyone thinks of me. I used to care what people thought of me, and I used to feel like I was out of place. I'd be in the, like, lab meetings with people who'd been to university and got degrees and i always felt like that the little guy in there and that shouldn't be there i always felt out of place and at first i think i felt out of place in the poker world too because i always knew i was never going to take like the academic approach to poker so when people on forums were like like going through like 
to be fair, um, equation, math, like, math, like, equations and math stuff that I didn't really understand very well. Again, I felt a little bit out of place, so I felt like, how can I ever be a winning 15 or 100 L player if I don't understand all that stuff? And mm, now I realise that whilst, whilst understanding all that stuff's really good, and if you can understand it, you should absolutely study it, it's not essential to be, to be a winning, like, <laughs> microstakes or... Mm, like upper micro stakes player it doesn't have to be if you game select well you don't have to be some like incredibly technically gifted poker player if you game select well you have really solid mental game and you're disciplined you, you can still make it work because that's exactly what i'm doing i'm far from an academic poker player i do a lot of stuff based on kind of just population reads and a feel for want of a better word as fishy as that sounds I just kind of know what's going on and a lot of the times i can't put words to it and i certainly can't put fucking maths to it but I just kind of, it took me ages to become comfortable in that situation because I wasn't as good at expressing my thoughts as other people and I certainly wasn't as good as like the math side of the game as other people were. I kind of felt like I don't I don't have a place in this. And it was only maybe two or three years ago, maybe maybe slightly more than that. I think it comes with like age and experience. I actually stopped giving a shit what other people thought of me or oh, this fucking guy's a useless knit, etc. Knit on a heater. I stopped, none of that bothered me anymore. And once that clicked into place i became much more comfortable in my own skin as a poker player and my results completely took off so i don't know maybe you just maybe it is a self-esteem thing i don't know it could be anything else i don't know you well enough to know but uh, i know you are quite like self-effacing you're quite a modest man so maybe it's something to do with that too you know maybe you think you're not good enough when i'm sure you are yeah i think it's just i'm just used to not not to say that you know things have gone badly in my life, you know nothing like that. But I'm I'm not used to handling kind of things going extremely well. So if I suddenly found, went from five and L to fifty and L, although it's only a game and it's you know it's fine, it kind of represents something that I'm not kind of used to of just like it actually working out. Do you know what I mean? It, I'm so, normally used. To- so yeah. So what ends up happening then is you start thinking this has got to start going wrong for me at some point because things don't usually go this right for me and yep. then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that's right which is why i always get on the brink or just enter the next level up and then find a way of, of screwing it up basically. yeah all getting <laughs> back, yeah and getting back to that comfort zone of like right i'll try again and get on because i know i'm good enough to do it. i've been up to that point a couple of times and if i just stick to my game that's not exactly ex- you know it's, it's not you know elite stuff or anything but it tends to work at these levels um, and I'll get there, and it will probably work at the next level as well. But I seem to then get convinced that I need to start changing some stuff, and that and that's only just there to make sure that I keep myself, get myself back down to where I kind of feel I belong. Does that make sense? It makes complete. You are saying a lot of th- things that I've one hundred percent been through myself. Um, when I move up, even now still, I make unnecessary adjustments to my game, and then I'm not. I mean, if I've had a game that's been beating the limit below for whatever, six, seven blinds, a hundred, I should absolutely move up and try and like, just continue that game. But if I was going to start making changes on the fly to my game, then I'm all of a sudden I, I wouldn't even be a six big blind winner at the, at the level below. So it makes no sense to move up and like, start adjusting your game. You should probably move up and just continue playing your normal game and then make adjustments as and when you've got enough of a sample size to understand things don't work at this level like that. But there isn't going to be that much difference between 5 and L and 10 and L. If, if you've got a game that works at 5 and L, it's almost certainly going to work at 10 and L. Mm-hmm. And if you've got a game that works at 30 and L, it's going to work at 50 and L. Maybe not quite as well, because you are going to be up against like, the jump between 30 and L to 50 and L. It's probably bigger than the jump from 5 and L to 10 and L in terms of like how many good, skilled, winning professional players are out of that limit. So, you, you know, you, if you have got any leaks, you are going to be more exposed and more exploited but um it's not going to be huge it really isn't going to be that big you know i mean my, one of my things i can be exploited for is i fall to too many three bets or i'm certainly trying to so i, mm-hmm. I know what some of my things are they're going to be exploited about and i'm comfortable with it because i know in other ways that as like folding to two, slightly over folding to three bets is better for me long term than calling too many three bets and then getting myself frustrated um if i'm under, if i'm aware that this leak is better than the than the leak that comes when I try and fix it. I'm aware of that. I'm very self aware of it, and yet yeah, I can just happy. I'm happy and I can deal with that. It's when I'm like start making adjustments into doing things that I know I can't handle doing, and I know I'm not really good at doing. That's when my game goes downhill. 
I mean, I, I would imagine I could take my exact 30 nil nitty game to 50 nil and possibly make more money. But then my mental game suffers a little bit at the moment because um, or it, or it was doing at 50 nil like snap and zoom because I just thought I was getting run over. And the truth is, I'm probably not getting run over. But I haven't got a good sample size of 50 nil these days because I haven't played it regularly on, on AAA or Poker for so long. I don't know where my win rate is. So then I have confidence issues like you have, which is why I'm sticking in my comfort zone of 30 nil. The problem with you sticking in your comfort zone of 5 nil is that you're never going to make very much money there. So you're going to find it hard justifying your time sometimes to play. Whereas if you've got yourself up to 30 nil, and you can start making four, five, six hundred dollars a month. You can perhaps justify the spent the time you spend playing on it when you're playing five and L and you're playing a lot of time and you may be making thirty, forty dollars a month. It's much harder to justify the amount of time you're putting into it. So maybe that's the thing for you as well, you know, maybe you need to think about, you know, get it five and L's my comfort zone, but why is it my comfort zone? Why why do I make the changes at ten and L? Because your reasons will be different to mine, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Why why do you think it is? Why why do you think that you try and change your game when you when you move up just like one limit yeah i think it's just that to be honest i'll justify it by saying that it's because i think there's going to be better players there so i'm going to need to be more aggressive and more aggravation and they're going to be bluffing me more but that's in game terms but i guess as, as we was saying earlier i think psychologically there's probably something else there it's kind of like um this I'm not sure I should be here yet. I haven't earned it enough or something like that. And it's just a way of, because your mind works in funny ways, isn't it? Even though you kind of, you can kind of word it in a certain way of what's happening, but what's actually happening is it's trying to um, put itself back in a position where not necessarily feels comfortable where it feels it belongs. So I'm guessing at the moment, maybe this time it will be different because uh, um, I'm just trying, it's hard to put it into words. It's kind of, what I say is happening won't necessarily be why it's happening. Does that th- make sense? Th- yeah, and I think you've got a chance of it being different this time because this might be the first time you've actually confronted it. Oh, definitely, yeah. Cause so more it might be better no- this time, you know, if, if it's something that you're, this might be the first time you've really thought about it and been aware of it, so you're ready to confront it when you move up and next time you move up, we, you're going to have, like, me by your side making sure that you don't lapse into that I don't deserve this and I'm going to change this and I'm going to change that because I'm going to be basically encouraging you to change absolutely nothing when you move up and then um, just we'll, we'll change things as and when we think we might need to but the I I know you in your experience there's a big jump between 5 and 10 now but that's usually because you've you've oh, made there be a big difference you, you've like created it in your own mind and then again it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy you know, hopefully this time when you've got somebody there next to you saying that Russ there's fucking no difference either. there's no difference look at the stats look at the players stats there's almost no difference hopefully then um, that'll help you get over like, the, the initial hump because the first few thousand hands the first few sessions when you move up they're always such a big deal it's a massive deal it's um, you build up to be something in your head that it just shouldn't be and there's ways we can get around this this time you know we can we can start just like playing half and half for example we don't just have to make a big deal of right we're stepping up now and we're going to start playing 10 and l and i'm a 10 and l player now going forward we could just say uh, about like every now and again russ when you're feeling good or when the pool looks good one table five one table ten and then um, we could just make it really gradual and try and make it so all your insecurities don't just come flying straight into your game do you not even think about raising that river there? No. Not because if I raise it and he comes over the top. Then we just have to fall, don't we? Because he's got a 10. <laughs> exactly. So I don't know. Would you? I wouldn't have considered that I, a spot I don't think to I raise. Have, I don't think I would have raised, but what I wouldn't have done is I wouldn't have absolutely turbo called. I would oh. have at least considered it. No, I wouldn't. That's not a spot where I consider raising, no. Which is interesting. Maybe I should. No, let's talk about you should you should always consider it. We shouldn't be snap doing anything. That's that was my only concern there. Oh, was um you you called like faster than the speed of light, you know, and um, yeah, I think calling probably is the best play. I'm not necessarily disputing your play. My my issue with the play was how quickly you did it. Oh, it's because in my mind I wasn't really stop it. and think about it. <laughs> no, that's because I wasn't actually. Uh, when I watched the hand play, I was just thinking, well, that, that wasn't going to do anything else but call. If we just check, check, flop, didn't we? So I run, you know, and then we check. Okay, <laughs> we, we just call the turn when we turn our pairs. There's no reason he has to have a 10. 
Um, oh no, no, that's a good point. I'm, I'm just not 100% sure what to do when I have like what am I doing here folding? Um, what did it come? It came 10, 10x, didn't it? And yeah. When I've got just two over cards there, I get this is one of those things where I've got the cards. Like, do you just try and check it down because you've got ace high and anything that they if you bet they're only going to call with like pairs that are beating you and they're not really going to call with much worse and then i'm thinking well do you bet to try and take out their equity to get them to fold their equity and i'm never quite sure what to do i'm so, going to take issue with that not with you personally with the whole fucking concept because it gets on my absolute fucking bell end it really does sorry for my language but no, all no. this people can't call with worse it's no it's nonsense it really is how often have you see better flop with that like ace king or something like that and then you've ch checked it down and they've and it's, it's been 10 10 3 something like that and it's gone check check turn check check river and the river's been a jack and they've had jack queen or something like that and then um, and they just do people do call with words it depends on the like 10 10 3 people will peel with stuff like jack queen king queen all those sets of hands way more than you can think they will because it's happened to me so many times and i'm like oh i'm not going to bet because i think they probably got a pocket pair like beneath the 10 and i don't think they're going to fold it because the pot's too small and i'm right they wouldn't have folded but it's because they've rivered a jack uh, with their queen jack and stuff and i just don't buy into all this people can't call with worse it's it's me it's one of the most overused and damaging cliches in poker right now um because people just do call with worse if yeah. people never call with worse we'd be all we'd all be bluffing every fucking you know we'd be bluffing our tits off but people do call with worse a lot of the time it's just an excuse people make because they're scared of getting raised or because they know they're shit at bet folding and most people who say that to me are people who i know who are crap at bet folding who don't have the discipline to bet for value and fold to a raise or they're scared of getting raised off the showdown value um it's just a weak play you know i i, I think when someone bets into us a river we have ace queen on 10 10 queen i think that's fine to call i am going off on a tangent here but mm -hmm. people who check back rivers because they're like oh i can't get called by a worse i'm not having that you know you can bet one third pot 40 percent pot something like that and get called by all kinds of worse hands if you've got like a top pair type hand or even a second pair type of hand and you're you're quite sure your opponent's you you know you, you you you're pretty confident you've got the best hand but you're just checking back winners there's loads of people who check way back way too many winners and that's why they find it really hard to beat the game and then um, it's i'm not saying you do that but um it's just a point that i wanted to make because you said you actually used the dreaded words i don't think you can call with worse and i think that's one of the worst cliches in poker at the minute i really really do yeah uh, that's the thing that's what i mean about having just the mixed concepts and you must say you get to the spot and you think well do i bet here with ace high or do i just check you know and there are spots where i'm beginning to if i see the overcoat if i say i have like jacks and it comes like queen high there are positions where i think well i've got range advantage here but i think once there are just some spots where i'm not sure where it's um good idea to just pop in a c bet when i can just you know, yeah to use those words it's kind of like you're only gonna get caught by worse <laughs> by better by better that's what yeah. you mean yeah and it's, yeah it's, sorry yeah and that happens sometimes that's what thin value does i mean that's what makes it thin sometimes we we don't have the best hand because someone's either played the hand like really quite weakly and passively or maybe the tra trappers or whatever but that's what thin value is you know it's the reason it's thin is because sometimes we lose with it but um when I mean, you were in the group session last night i was making some river value bets and we were how many times did we say wow in one session Mm -hmm. because we couldn't believe some of the fucking garbage that people were calling us with and they just do you know people aren't making big folds that's why we can't just go bluffing every river that ever existed mm -hmm. at every turn because people just make calls and if you, if you want to decide that whether to make a thin value bet or not just think to yourself you know would i bluff here and if you like you know if you think just put yourself on having like some mm -hmm. kind of like air type hand or like some kind of like really weak showdown value just think just like, would i bluff here and if they're like no i wouldn't because you know i'd be too scared about getting called by third pair or whatever <laughs> well then there's no reason not to value base that because if you if you're going to get caught if you're scared of getting called by third pair when you're bluffing that should be every reason to value bet in exactly the same spot because third pair can call 
Mm-hmm. You can't have it both ways. I see people making the argument both ways. You know, we can't bluff you because he won't fold bottom pair, uh, but we can't value bet you because he won't call with worse. I mean, you can't have it both ways. You read what people do. People like uh, they run with the hare and hunt with the hounds, mm-hmm. and it's usually people who are just a little bit too weak tight, and it's usually rivers, and it's usually what's the difference between somebody having a win rate that blasts them through a limit and the guys that are just stuck there forever is usually the two biggest leaks are calling too often and missing value and it's that the, they've been the two biggest leaks of poker players like forever in a day and the, to my to my mind they still continue to be the two biggest leaks <laughs> yeah so i'm just I'm, I'm not sure if i'm getting confused in that spot there they bet into me didn't they and, and i called I didn't yeah, check. Yeah, we checked the flop. We checked the flop back. The flop went check, check. They probed the turn with their sevens. You called. And then they bet the river and you called. And I think it's fine. I probably wouldn't have raised either. And I wouldn't even have died. The only reason I mentioned it in the first place is because how quick you made the decision. And then you went ahead and you said the dreaded phrase. And I was just like, no, we can't have that. We need to address this issue. Um. Hmm. I think this is one where I'm going to check back there. Yeah, this is more. It's harder to get called by worse here. <laughs> so because of the board, just because of the board. Te- wow. <laughs> just because of the board texture. That genuinely is hard to get called by worse there. So you've got like aces and kings with a crap kicker. So it really is because you know, there's a lot for him to be scared of there with his like pocket queens, pocket jacks, pocket tens things. Um, so yeah, that is a spot where I would absolutely check back. Yeah, but if I'm we had to say um, an ace queen or something there, then I wouldn't check back because we can get called by ace jack and, and win all of a sudden. Get called by ace ten and win. So that's the kind of situation that I'd be looking at there. Ace yeah, seven to check back. Ace queen's probably a value bet, I think. Mm-hmm. And then and I would have got owned by quads. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I can't do much about it. I think with the other hand, with the ace queen, I think if I'd been the one who was, oh, this is just going in now. He's only got 40 behind. Um, yeah, if I'd been the one who was making the bet, then I would have considered. I would have. I wouldn't have just checked the river there. If that makes sense, I would have yeah. made. I would have made a bet to look to get called by. I'd have sized it to maybe get were called by worse Queen X or something like that. But I think when they bet, then yeah, that's it. It was an insta call, and it probably did look a bit rubbish. But in my mind, it looks rubbish. I'd just rather see you. We're only two tabling. I'd rather see you just pause for a second. You know, it's not going to hurt your grind. It's just, I mean, it's it's a conversation I have with almost every single player I ever do any work with when we're doing live sweats. Is There's no reason to just snap call anything. It, yeah, we, we're probably going to check back, but it doesn't hurt to take a few seconds just to ratify it. Yeah, this really, is a spot I'm not quite sure about. It's when these players donk out like this. I'm just, I never... put a small raise in here then just shut the turn. Really, I'd, 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 I'd race to like eight or something like that. He'll probably call, and that'll give us a chance to just like slight over bit shove the turn. Well, I'll raise a little bit. That's what, I, that's what I would do here. Oh, I'm not going to now. Well, the ace shouldn't be that much of a scare card to us. Okay, this is probably where my thinking goes. It is thinner now. Of course, it's thinner. Uh, I would, if we're going to bet, I would just stick him in. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering how much it was going to be, but. Oh, it's, fair. It's, it's okay. it, Take it's me through un- your thinking there, then, because I get those spots wrong right, so often. We'll, we'll end the video on this. Right? Set out your next big blinds, and we'll, yep. we'll, um, we'll review that at the death. Let's get through I mean, these. The ace is unfortunate for us there, because it's kind of just... It gives us too much fold equity, which is obviously what we don't want when we're thin value betting. Right, you can see that on your screen. Yeah, that's perfect. Oh, beautiful. Okay, do you want to go back to the... Right back, well... Go to the flop because that's where it kind of started, wasn't it? He called. So what happened pre-flop? Did he limp and then we isolate, or did he raise? No, I, I open under the gun with queen ten suited. Right. Okay. okay just okay, some, yeah. add some extra hands in here. No, so that's I, fine. No, I just wasn't sure. I, I, I got mixed up. So I know, yeah. no, I opened that. Too. I think everyone opens queen ten suited. So I've no issue with that. So we've opened it. This guy's probably not a regular given his stack size. <laughs> so when he donks, what are you? Given his stack size, is, what are you scared of? I'm just not sure what they're doing because the amount of time... Because when they donk, or sometimes they just min bet as well. And it's just... It just confuses me. I, I, I guess that's probably why it's a good strategy. It just completely baffles me because sometimes I raise and then they call and then they min bet again on the turn and then you're just like, well... And sometimes I've done it where I've had like... Um, 
some equity but not actually a made hand so here well i've got top pair sometimes i haven't had that and then they just keep going and you sort of cool down and they just have something either like reasonably strong like two pair and you think well why are they betting it so weirdly or they have absolutely nothing but it's better than your so nothing. what two pair are they realistically going to have on this board uh, no i'm just uh, these are just examples of all right sorry 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 but i'm guessing I'm just not sure they're don. I'm just not sure what they're thinking. If he's donking a set, then oh. hallelujah, you know, yeah, he's, he's going to absolutely 100% double through me. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm I'm fully aware of that. It's going to happen, and, and or whatever. I'm just at peace with it, completely at peace with it. Um, it's much harder if they have a full stack because it, it makes raising a lot more dicey. Because do I want to get 100 blinds in here? Absolutely no. Am I comfortable getting 40 blinds in with top pair against somebody whose ranges are likely to be all over the shop because they're, they're not a regular player or they're unlikely to be regular given the stack size? Um, I don't care for 40 blinds. So I've got top pair, good kicker, backdoor flush draw against somebody who's likely to be a bad player. So therefore, at this point, I'm just going to be like, right, just get all the money in now. Or, or, you know, let's just raise him. He can be donk calling with 6-5. He can be donk calling with ace-3, ace-4, um, worst queens. There's tons and tons of worse hands he's not going to fold. So I'm just going to be aware that because he's a bad player, or I think he's a bad player, and he's making, like, not a bad line, because I've, I've started to be donking more into my game now. So I don't necessarily hate the donk, but I just think his ranges for donkings going to be, like, a lot worse than... A, than a better player's dunking range. So you think we're going to be able to get called by worse tons of the time. And I want to set up a turn shove because I don't want to deal with the king coming on the turn and ace coming on the river. I don't have to deal with that. I'm confident in my equity now. I think I've got the best hand most of the time. If he's got, like, if he has got, like, me out flopped, if he's got, like, king, queen, ace, queen, all one of the sets, tough shit for me. Um, but I just want to, like, he's, he's looking like he wants to put money in the pot. I want to put a bit more in so I can just shove the turn. That's kind of where I'm at with this. I mean, if we can raise this bet to around 40 cents and he calls, that's going to put like a dollar, what's he going to put, a dollar 10, dollar 20 in the pot. He's going to have like a dollar 50 left, dollar 45 left. And we can just like slightly over bet shove the turn because I don't want to make it a huge raise because I don't want to blow him off the pot. I'd rather just make a smaller raise here, have him call and over bet the turn than have him fold anything now, if you will. And, I mean, we should really be wanting to raise this to 60 to shove the turn. But I think raising to 60... It, it might make him fold some of the stuff I don't want to make him fold. So I'm more than happy just putting a small raise in. And when he calls, saying that now that the guy's got something, I don't think he's got a set or something because I think he just shove a set. Then I'm just going to jam the turn. And I don't care what the turn is. I'm just going to jam it by this point because I'm just committing myself to it. And I'd rather take that line than just have a bad player with the, like the short stack like dictate the action when I when I had the initiative. I don't want him taking the initiative away from me for the three big blind bet. So I just think against him, against me, if you were playing against me, and I, I mean that in not a big-headed way, but if you are playing against somebody, a regular, who's, whose ranges aren't really, really shit, you might not want to raise when I donk into you here, because I'm going to be donking sets most of the time. Because uh, I'm not going to have 6-5 suited in my range, because I'm not going to defend that against you under the gun. So I'm going I'm to have all the sets. I mean, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't three-bet you with pocket queen. So. so why would you donk, I can understand donking a set if there was, if it was, if it was a wetter board, but why would you donk, a set here as a good player, as a more reasonable player. I'm not, you know, this guy could have been doing that. I'm not yeah. sure. Could, but what would be the reasoning for doing like a donking a set of fours something here? So well, I wouldn't always do it, but when I would donk a set of fours here is when I think my opponent doesn't see bet enough. So if if I'm playing somebody who's got say a forty, who I know has got like a forty five percent c bet. Mm -hmm. I dunk into them constantly and I dunk draws into them and I dunk made hands into them because they're just, they're just disappointed by checking too often I don't want to be disappointed by them checking back and if I was playing like some super aggro player like a 70 or 80% C bet then there's not I wouldn't dunk it in a million years sure so it's, it's very very opponent dependent so if I was playing against you and I know you're probably with all due respect you're going to check back ace king here I might dunk into you because I don't think you'd fold ace king for one bet here I don't think a, if you had ace king here and I dunked into you for two thirds pot, I don't think you'd find a four with two overs and like a backdoor straight draw. So I, I'd be dunking into you because I think you're going to check back some hands, you know. And, and if I do check raise you, you're going to get away from most of your hands, you know. Mm -hmm. if, if you've got king queen here and I and you see bet and I raise you to like you see bet twenty and I raise you to seventy five or whatever, you're going to get away from your king queen too. 
Mm-hmm. So um, I'm not too worried about just like checking to you to try and win a C bet from you. I'm wanting to make sure your bets go in the street because I've got a strong hand. So against passive players, I'm going to pick up the initiative straight away because I want to bet three street. I want money going on on three streets because if I don't get money in on three streets, I can't make a big river bet. But if you check back, once you check back the flop, my chance to win a big pot of almost gone. Sure. But, but if I'm playing against an aggressive player, especially an aggressive player who like doesn't really respect raises then I'm just going to check raise them and I'm going to check raise them really quite small in the hope that they just do something ridiculous and shove over me or find a way to call and what have you it's very villain dependent and if I don't have a read on my opponent I usually just dunk my made hands because my general view of the population is they might see bet flops weak but people aren't double barreling weak very often <laughs> so I may as well just pick up the lead straight away and um, and that, that's my reason for doing it. That's why I started dunking more because the games are just playing so damn passively. Um, it seems like the more people get into this GTO thing, the more people are balancing the range by fucking checking everything. You know, <laughs> it's not balancing by betting everything. They're balancing by fucking checking everything. Sure. And the games have definitely got more. The, 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 the pretty aggro pre-flop still, but post-flop they getting. They seem to be getting more and more passive. Mm-hmm. So in games that are getting more and more passive, we need to start ticking the initiative more and more. In my opinion. And um, that's, so that's why I'm starting to donk more, just because I think people are just balancing by checking back too much. But if I'm going to balance, I'd rather balance by betting too much, personally. If, if I mean, that sounds stupid. But people are like, oh, I've got to protect my whatever range here, so I'm going to protect it by checking. And I'd rather think, well, I've got to protect this way. You know, I'd, I'd rather be aggressive, personally, but um, mm. who knows? And I could be wrong on that, but that's how, it feel, that's how it feels. Like, the people who are doing GTO badly, in my opinion, are checking too much. And it's just making the games really quite passive post flop. Sure, and wouldn't that also mean? I'm, I'm, I know a lot of people are trying to apply that GTO stuff, but doesn't it also work on the fact that your opponents have to be observing that you're doing that? Do you see? Um, what I mean? no, I'm not sure. The whole point of GTO is it doesn't matter. You don't care what your opponent does because you're effectively being like perfectly balanced. So when you're playing, if you're playing like G. Um, if you're playing that game theory optimal, mm. it doesn't matter what your opponent does because you're unexploitable. <sighs> that, that's like that's the kind of the very very. And I don't know anything about GTO whatsoever because I've not even looked at it because it just boggles my mind. But the, essentially, it just means I'm doing something and I'm unexploitable. So it doesn't matter to me whether my opponent calls, raises, or folds because my frequencies are perfect. So it doesn't matter to me what they do. <laughs> right. That's okay. effectively what it is. Uh, in a nutshell, I'm not going to go into any more than that because I'll end up looking fucking stupid because no, no, I don't understand fine. it well enough. <laughs> but that's kind of what it is, you know. It's about like it's about making yourself unexploitable. The problem is if if everyone's playing like GTO against each other, nobody ever fucking wins, and the rate just wins. But that's a completely different argument. I think loads of people at the micro are trying to do it and they're doing it very, very badly, and it's making people very, very passive. That's that's my opinion on on the current population. I mean, mm-hmm. poker was way more aggressive two or three years ago. Everyone was three betting like nobody's business. People had like 11 12 percent three bets. They had like seventy five percent C bets in three bet pots. Now it's totally different. It's like people are C betting like quite a lot of people C betting between like forty five fifty percent. The C betting, they're making the bets incredibly small, like the betting like one third, one quarter pot to like to try and protect the bluffs and all these kind of weird things that, that might work well in games where there's loads of cool dynamics, but don't work well against complete unknowns who are probably very, very exploitable. But that's a different argument altogether that I'm mm-hmm. certainly not going to get into. But Doug Polk said GTO's bullshit, so Doug, if Doug Polk says it, then it's good enough for me as well. Fair so enough. That's, that's, that's my take on that. So yeah, in this situation like this, the guy's dunking. Um, <laughs> Um, we're ahead of his range for doing it. He can definitely call with worse. And I want to just build the pot so I can shove the turn before the board runs out really shit. So that's why I would have done it there. And if I get stacked by threes or fours, then I get stacked by threes or fours. It's 40 blinds. And against his range, he was doing fine. So that's why I would have raised and then just shoved the turn. Okay. Okie dokie, bud. Sounds well, good. enjoyed that. It's been a nice long video. Thank you very much, Russ. And um, we'll catch up with you next week, Woody. Fantastic. Look forward to it. Take care now. Bye-bye, buddy. See ya.